Well, I've got a question <laughs> that uh, Cody asked me. He, he didn't want to ask it because he said he might get run out of the room, but I thought it was a good question. Um, <clears throat> what would inspire us to want to be moral in the first place? That's part of it. Yeah, you know. If it's not going to get gain you anything, like immortality, or why, why, why be good? Reminds me of my mother. I came home when she had just heard on the radio a radio minister from First Christian Church say that he didn't believe in hell. And my mother was apoplectic. She said, I can't believe he said that. She says, and here was her argument, which really depressed me. She said, if there's no hell, why be good? I said, so you're just... You're trying to be good for what? <laughs> to avoid the pit? <laughs> well, this is nonsense. But your, your question had to do with uh, my uh, second virtue to some extent. I don't believe you can be a really genuinely morally committed person without being inspired to do it. And that's the reason I think the sacred is so important. Depth is what gives you the inspiration to want to live that out. And it may be connected to uh, an immortality of one sort or another. It may not. But you're inspired by the very realization that you're in the midst of an incredible, incredible and boundless living experiment. We're in it all the time. And to be inspired is to find the depth. That's how I would, and I worked on that a little bit as I reflected on this whole thing. So I think it's a very good question. What inspires you to be decent? Isn't that an interesting question? And I'm not going to give you a final answer. I've worked on it a good bit, but I'm not going to give you a final answer because you can probably figure this out. Go deep. Yes. Tom, your book, Lusting for Infinity, uh, yes. you, you set a lot of it outdoors, and mm -hmm. uh, you have a real affinity, if I'm not mistaken, for the outdoors. Yeah. Uh, why do you set it outdoors, and what's the connection with the infinity? <laughs> You're bad. <laughs> uh, no, it's beautiful. And uh, I, I will quote my wife. She said, I think I'm becoming a nature mystic because we live in a place where we can live outdoors most of the time and we love it. In the book, I talk about the uncontrived world. And when I go into a wilderness like the Pecos wilderness I do in the book, I find there's something I am not in charge of in any way, but I'm part of it. Something that is other than, but it still claims me, and I claim it. And that's a kind of what I mean by a sacred sense of, of the good earth. And of course, our environmental disaster is directly the result of losing that. And we've flattened out everything, and therefore there's no depth where you recognize that sacrality is in the stuff of the whole thing, not in this dogma or that dogma or this practice or that practice, but in the very stuff of existence. And so, you know, I've been going into nature for a long time. We've been backpackers for years, and, and generally we go for that reason, just to be there. You know, I remember reading in uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, I think it was La, La Nocce, where he talks about one day observing a root jutting out of the ground, and he writes for three or four pages on the absurdity of a root, just being there. And that's when I said, Jean, you're crazy. <laughs> you know, because when I think of a root, I think of depth itself. You know, and you look at a, a ponderosa pine out in the wilderness, and you look up at it, standing a hundred or so feet in the air, 
and think about it below the ground and what's holding it there. That's amazing. You know, and when scientists can keep their minds clear and not just get into the technology of it, but live deeply with that which they are studying. And I, I've read, if you ever want to read a great book, um, it's, um, uh, see, the title of it is The Practical Mystic by Sir Arthur Eddington. But no, it's a biography about Sir Arthur Eddington. Listen to what the title says, Practical Mystic. He and Einstein worked very closely together, especially on the concept of relativity. And I think it is a, a brilliant thing that he did. He had, a, he had a passion for science, and he had a deep passion for what it revealed to him. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yes. Hey, back a million years ago, when you used to teach philosophy of uh, religion, yeah. you talked about the four um, eras of, that humanity has gone through and that we are in the canopy of the contemporary, yeah. but we're at the tail end of it. Yeah. And the implication that I always got from that mm -hmm. is that we are part of a larger cycle and we are in that part of the wavelength. The downside. Of, the yes. downside of it. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you could relate what you were talking to tonight to this idea of mm -hmm. these big cycles, developmental yeah. cycles. Historical cycles. I go back into ancient mythology and I come through the emergence of rationality and various uh, cycles and then this modern one is the cycle of, uh, that is dominated by scientific thinking. Uh, th that's how. Now you're going back, by the way, about 18 years. So let me let me not overstate this. But what what is really powerful to me in that, uh, Dara, is that we are in a down cycle, and I believe another cycle is going to come. I don't know what shape it's going to take. I am unwilling to predict the future. We're in a very, uh, on the edge of a chaotic period, but transitional periods are that way. And when you, when you start anything new, have you ever noticed the transitions you have to go through to sustain the process? And it's that kind of thing that I pretty much have in mind uh, by that. And I think we are in that era. And it, I don't know how long it's going to be. Uh, I think it will... Uh, It'll last much longer than my lifetime. And I, we even talk about our grandchildren and struggle with what they're going to face if we don't resolve some of the issues of our time and, uh, and do it with, uh, with a moral fervor and grounding. And that means not looking at somebody because they're of another ethnicity or another religion and putting them down ever. You know? It's just, it's, it's, it's out of bounds. You can't do that. And therefore, the other is a presence to me. And I've got to learn every day how to live that out. Let me give you an example. Just last week, I have uh, at long last, I, I held out for a long time, but I've at long last gotten on Facebook. <laughs> a lot of it is ridiculous. You know? Uh, philosophy as bumper sticker. Um, but some of it is, is, is useful. I'd stay in touch with friends, some of whom are in this room, right, Rick? Uh, yes, and, uh, and that's, that's fun. And I just get on it a few minutes each day just to see what's going on. But I was looking one night through it, and a, and a man, a stranger to me, with a handlebar mustache, Caption under his picture, what's wrong with slavery? Jesus never spoke against it. Now, my first impulse was to crawl into the screen and choke him. <laughs> you know, it was just idiotic. But then I realized he's a human being with a history that has precipitated that kind of thinking. How in the world did we fail sufficiently that that would be a question? And that's my job, is to take that person seriously even though I don't agree with a thing he said. How do you do that? I'm not good at it, you know. 
Because when you know the truth, you want to hammer it home <laughs> until you realize you don't yet have it. But that's, that's a powerful kind of thing that we've got to take on. Yes. Well, are we ready to go home? No, no, I was, oh, okay, I was Roxanne. Saying, when we're doing the survey, we didn't hear your talk on compassion. Yeah, one of the so questions. Well, I, you know, I forgot it. Uh, you know, I write lectures. It's in my lecture. But I don't like reading lectures. That's ridiculous, <laughs> you know. And so I didn't get to compassion, but I just missed it. You should have thrown something at me at the moment. But the third, okay, the three virtues. Virtue one, perseverance. Virtue two, self-regulation. Virtue three, compassion. And that fits with my third division. You know, when you meet the other, meet them with compassion. And it's a powerful word. I've, I've been... I've been amazed at how widely it is used and how profoundly it is used, especially in Buddhist tradition, but in many other traditions as well. And Barbara has a book she's done with workshops how many times? Uh, on the 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life. And uh, I, Karen Armstrong wrote that book as part of having won $100,000 for her TED Talk. And, uh, and she worked on that. And it's helped us to understand how Every day it is and how graphic it is. You know, what is it like to have compassion? Now, I'm going to tell you a story that doesn't sound like that at all. Because it's so simple. And it's so every day. And it isn't <laughs> profound and often not heroic. But we put our grandson on the bus yesterday, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And he was going to ride uh, to Dallas. That's another story. He's German, and therefore, he thinks buses work. <laughs> but but he, uh, he's an amazing kid. He's 25 years old, and I just watched him get, take his luggage over to the bus, and he was, there's a woman behind him, and he started to put his luggage on, and he turned around before he got it on and saw she had some, and so he put his luggage down, went over and said, let me help you with that, and put it on. He's just a kid. That's compassion. It's just simple. It's, it's, it's that every day. But it also goes to profundity. You know, it is to suffer with compassion. To suffer with. To identify with the other as another. And I was, I was going to chat about that for a little bit, but I was afraid you were getting restless. And... Uh, uh, you know, but I, I appreciate you bringing it up. It is an incredibly powerful term. It's the most powerful in that triad of terms to me because it's the one that makes the other two fit together. And so I, I thank you, Roxanne. I'm not surprised, but I thank you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. I want depth, but I think I lack the time for it. Aha! And so the secular world takes my time so yeah. much that uh -huh. I don't have time for depth, and I'm starving often. Mm -hmm. um, now that's a part of the flatness of the secular age. Right. You know, it just pulls at us, night and day, all the time. All and, the technology and we, that, yeah. know, tries to make us more efficient in our yeah. jobs, makes yeah. us work yeah. 30 hours a day sure. in a 24-hour day. So that's right. I mean, yeah, well, the answer is retire. No, no, <laughs> no I'm, I'm teasing, I'm teasing, of course, that's not even fair. But um, another thing Paul Tillich taught me long ago, someone asked him, uh, uh, what do you do about, uh, I think it was the spiritual life or something like that, because it, it takes a lot of time. He says, no, it doesn't take any of your time. Let it permeate all of your time. And in a way, I think you can go deep. I can go deep in a faculty meeting. In fact, I've had to go deep to survive it <laughs> at times. But, yeah, in that, but you, you know, but you, it's, a, it's a real discipline to live in the busy world with that kind of sense of awareness and reflective consciousness that lets your life be teaching you that. And, I, you know, I, we would all like to go once in a while and sit on a mountain or take a canoe down the river or whatever, and many of us can't do that. And most of us can't do it very often, not nearly as often as we'd like to. 
And that, I have been amazed at students. When Barbara and I came back to the university for our second career, for my second career, with, with Alan Hertzke, our fantastic leader, um, I, uh, I got busy, but uh, I enjoyed it so much, I didn't mind at all. But here's what I learned. I would meet a student, like, you know, it could be you, Cody, but it's just a student on the campus. I'd say, how are you doing? And they always said one of two things. I'm so busy, or I'm so tired. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if you're 19 or 20 years old, and this is true, <laughs> come over here with me at 82 and we'll show you some tired. <laughs> but but you, you see, it is just... In fact, I like T.S. Eliot's way of putting that. We are distracted from a distraction by a distraction. Just a whirlwind of distraction. And there's a way of coming to terms with that in your own quietness, in your own, inner, in your own inwardness. But it is not easy to develop that. It really isn't. And so I'm not trying to be flippant. I don't think it is a flippant no, matter. it's hard to develop it in a volleyball gym. That's it. With That's my it. Daughter. Yeah. It's hard yeah. To develop exactly. It you know, I mean, sure. It's just hard. That's right. With all the noise and That's the chaos right. of the world. That yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't think there's a magic bullet, yeah. but I think it's a serious thing that you are voicing for many people mm -hmm. when you say that. Because you're not alone. I think culture has to change. That. No, and, and the, that's the reason my second cleavage was the cultural cleavage where you have a flattened out secularity where everything is kind of the same thing. And it isn't that way. Mm -hmm. So I think your question is very valid, and that's one of the places I, I trust we'll walk. I live mostly, as Barbara would say, I live a lot in the interior life, just wandering around, puzzling through things and working through things. And I like to do that. But I've been doing it for a long time, and now I'm retired. You know, and I can do it. Okay, Nancy, we're going to need to quit, don't we? Okay, we got one more question, and I'll shut up. I don't want to ask any. No. Well, you're welcome to ask your question, but you are the only thing standing between us and the reception room. So. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Thank no God. pressure. Let me just put that out there. I don't know if I can do that to everybody. No. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. We'll, we'll talk. Um, Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. question of what would you ground in morality in or you know, mm -hmm. why, why be moral in the first place. Yeah. It got me thinking about a, a potential other cleavage within this realm of the faith. Yes. A, a, a cleavage perhaps between the universal and the particular. Oh boy. And I think I sympathize more often with the movement toward the universal and the particular worries me mm -hmm. because it's so often yeah. But the particular, I think, gets at what you're talking about with death yeah. in such a unique way. Yeah. When, when morality is grounded in the burning bush, when morality is mm -hmm. grounded at the living us in the face of the other, yeah. jolting you and demanding, don't kill me. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the role of the particular. Yeah. I'm sorry I didn't have that idea, but I'm glad because I would not have known how to do the lecture in less than two and a half hours. But I think, it's, I think the universal particular is just crucial. Now I'm going to give you an analogy from work that Barbara and I did this fall. And it has to do with going to the Parliament of the World's Religions in Salt Lake City. And here you're dealing with a broad-based interfaith coalition of human beings trying to deal with the environment, trying to deal with women's issues, trying to deal with all the issues of the day from across vast differences. And when I would listen to people, they are trying to honor their particularity, their traditions, their culture, their religion, whatever it is. They're trying to honor that while at the same time being together in the full sweep of things. 
And I, th I remember using the phrase in my own head, we are dealing here with the universal particular. You know what? I do not want a Muslim to be any other thing than a Muslim as long as they want to be a Muslim. That's their particularity. And I think trying to convert a Muslim is idiotic trying to understand Islam, mm -hmm. trying to dig in with them and enjoy their uniqueness and their distinctiveness is powerful. But I believe sufficiently in the universal uh, prospect of our lives that the particulars have to start with being honored. You know, and I, it sounds like in a lecture I'm making fun of people because I have fun with people. But I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm not making fun of my mother, you know? I'm not making fun of my daughter and her kittens. I'm not making fun. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm just trying to play, not much. <laughs> but, you, you know that, you know, oh, I love the universal particular. The first time I ever read about it was in Hegel. And it just, oh, it broke things open for me. We've got to live particularly because we're this finite bundle of bones. And we have to live it out particularly. But if we don't live it in light of the transcending of, the, of that boundary, but the way I transcend it is not by me and my effort, but by meeting you. And, uh, you know, you are, as, a, as another, become a presence. And when you do, we lay claim to each other. Sunday morning I was asked to do a little talk and I said, the other claims me. You know, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And uh, if the other doesn't claim you and you run roughshod over it, you have lost your own sense of the universal within your own particularity. I do but deeply believe that. And, and that's, that's the, kind of the angle I would take. But if I don't quit now, uh, uh, Nancy's going to turn off the lights, so I'm going to quit. <laughs> oh, thank you. Hello. Great job. Great job. Thank you.